let's jump into what we came here for, which is to use my give credit where credit's due Jefferson Arsenal paper cartridge kit so that I can have not only confidence that I'm doing it right, but also the correct uh, materials so that I don't blow up my musket when I try to go fire it, because that can happen if you do it wrong. All right, let's jump in. All right, welcome to my voiceover. Uh, this is, I'll tell you a little bit more about the class that I took and the process for applying for my license to carry. Uh, if you've watched the prior videos, you know that because of a Supreme Court decision earlier this year in which the court went uh, from what was a two-step process for determining whether laws that restricted firearms use uh, were unconstitutional or not, now they've gone to a single-step process, which involves essentially uh, saying that all laws should be consistent with the uh, tradition and intent of the Second Amendment um, as it was framed, you know, in the in the 1790s. Um, and uh, this is a very radical change. And it, it, for Massachusetts in particular, it has meant that there has been dramatic alteration in the way all of the Massachusetts state laws governing licensing are being applied. The biggest issue being that uh, town police departments or county sheriffs no longer have the ability to apply restrictions uh, to your license. You either have a license to carry or you do not. And you cannot be denied the license to carry for um, you know, frivolous or subjective reasons. Subjective reasons being like, well, I don't like the way you looked or you didn't wear the right clothes when you came to the application process or, or what have you. And, and the, the target that I showed with my uh, bullets pretty nicely in the middle of the target, also if I do say so myself. Um, there's one more town, I guess, in Massachusetts, according to my firearms instructor, that still requires that. Um, but they actually can't use it as a basis for applying restrictions, at least under the current interpretation of the law. Thanks to the handy instructions from the folks at Jefferson Arsenal, uh, it explains what I've been doing here, which is cutting the threads that I'm going to use to tie off. Earlier I said twine, I think. Threads that I'm going to use to tie off. Because it's a very light thread. It's very combustible. It's going to burn up nicely in the black powder uh, together with paper. Now, all this kit really is is the thread and little pieces of paper from that time period that are you know, likely to combust. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I have to put what's called the choking cord. And this choking cord is what we're going to use to get a nice tight wrap of the paper when we need to cinch it down after we put the ball in and put the powder in, which you'll see here in a minute. This, uh, I've got to clamp to my, to my table here so that I can use it to pull. And I will pull um, and tighten the um tighten the end of the cartridge um, and then tie it off with thread so that's what you're going to see me trying to do here and who knows whether it will go well when it came time for all of us in the class to fire on the target you know we go line up they give us ear protection and and uh glasses for eye protection and, and line us up and sh uh, make sure that we know how to handle uh, a weapon how to load it how to check that it's uh, unloaded, how to manage the safety, all of those kinds of things, which you would want someone to know for their own well-being. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a quick class. I mean, you're in there for a couple hours. Most of it's conversation. There's very little hands-on, really. Uh, but they, you know, they won't let you advance in any of the steps if you can't confidently demonstrate that you know how to hold the weapon properly, point it safely, uh, manage the safety, and manage the ammunition. So they do all of that with dummy ammunition, rubber rubber bullets and, and so on, um, and rubber guns, so that you're not actually working with, with any live uh, weapons. And this is just the way it's done in Massachusetts. I'm not an expert on how it's done elsewhere across the country, uh, but it seemed a fairly um, reasonable process, but also not one that really guarantees that you necessarily know what you're doing with a weapon. They, they really strongly suggest, by they I mean the the school that I took my courses with really strongly suggests that you go on and do training in other particular weapons or hunting training if that's what you're going to try to do with weapons. Um, and of course, they sell weapons as well at the firing range where I took the courses. So, you know, they, they have a vested interest in you being a safe uh, gun user. So very interesting process to me. Uh, I mentioned before that very few people were had, ever, had actually handled a weapon before, much less fired one. Um, firing 22 caliber pistols or, or revolvers is a great way to get someone firing for the first time because there's so little kickback and there's barely even any noise, even though you have ear protection on, but still. 
Um, but I, I really don't know how confident I would be in my neighbor if they came home from one of these classes and said, look, I, I, bought, a, I bought a pistol and now I own a gun. It's one of the things that makes constitutional law so intriguing in our country. Um, and one of those things that I think is going to be a source of contention on this topic for a long, long time is that the Constitution expressly says we have the right to bear arms. And, and there are people who will say things like, well, that means those kinds of arms that were available in the day, or that means that it's only for militia use because the text of the Second Amendment, it, depending on how you parse it, could imply that. Um, I, there's, I don't think that's a strong argument, personally, that this was only intended for militia use. Um, I've written elsewhere in an essay that, that I can link to uh, associated with this video um, that actually gun ownership was, was considered a, a responsibility that the men in the community did to serve the community, was to be ready to serve in a militia, and one of the ways they did that was to make sure they had a, a proper firearm um, so that they could participate uh, if anything happened, you know, and, and anything in their definition could be a skirmish with the French, a skirmish with the natives, uh, or eventually the Revolutionary War. Um, Thomas Jefferson, for example, um, was famous for the love that he had for these two gift pistols, Turkish pistols that were given to him. I've seen pictures of them. They look, they're beautiful. Um, and I think once I get through this stage of learning more about musket fire, I, I might dabble in the flintlock pistols because what an interesting thing that is. I'm also a huge fan of um, Tecumseh, uh, if you know any of his story, which I haven't even bothered to try to capture in, in this conversation because it happened separately from the Revolutionary War, but it certainly was an important part or sorry, at the start of the Revolutionary War. It happened separately from the in incidents that are happening here in Massachusetts, but it certainly then feeds into the, the uprising that Tecumseh was part of. Tecumseh had two pistols, and he used to um, stick them in his uh, the top of his, of his leggings. Uh, he didn't only wear breechcloth. He, he tended to wear leggings with frills on him, evidently. Fascinating character. Anyway, the point is, uh, carrying pistols was a really, really normal thing to do, and there wasn't any any discussion about banning those and in fact many of the state constitutions i think um, pennsylvania is one of them expressly uh, made it clear that we're talking about personal weapons to carry for your own personal protection the, the, the constitution doesn't say that anyway i'm not going to get into the dif the difficult parts of constitutional law that's not the purpose of this conversation i'm more just specifying that it is interesting to me as someone who hasn't owned a gun his entire life until this musket um, other than when I was a kid and I shot, you know, little um, 22s and things like that and BB guns, of course. I, I have always believed that it would be really, really hard to get a weapon. I mean, the, the pro-gun people make it seem like it's really an onerous process and you have to be on waiting lists and go, go through all of these um, clearances that are invasive or whatever. I, honestly... I guess if I had done any of the things that the application asked me if I've done, you know, I've been convicted of a felony or anything like that, it would be difficult. Uh, I'm not like the vast majority of Americans. And so for me, it was just take my certificate that I got from the uh, shooting range and the class instructor, take it to my police department, schedule an appointment. Actually, scheduling an appointment was the hardest part. Uh, they didn't get back to me in the emails or phone messages. I had to leave messages for a couple weeks. And finally, the gentleman called me and said, uh, I'm ready to schedule your appointment. When can you come? I was there in a couple of days. I, I sat with him, interviewed him. He did my fingerprints, took my picture. Um, but he, he didn't interview me for why do you want this? Because they can't do that anymore. That, that's one of the changes since the change in the in the Supreme Court. So he basically said, look, it's going to take three months, which made me think, you know, if I were one of those women who were getting this license to carry to protect myself against a disgruntled boyfriend or something, that those three months would feel pretty painful. For me, it wasn't a big deal. Um, three months just meant I had to postpone making these awesome videos. Um, but now I've got it and, and I'm moving forward. So um, just a very different process. The police officer wasn't rude or he wasn't kind. He's just doing his job. And Three, we, three months later, I got a, a phone call saying your license to carry is here to pick it up. And I went down to the police department, asked, told them my name, and they had to sort through a stack of about 50 of these and gave me mine. And now I have a license to carry. Okay, let's get in here for a minute. Um, as you can see, I've made six of them at this point. And a couple of tricks to it that you learn that I, I don't think are intuitive from watching other people do it online, which I've done now a couple of times. Um, you probably noticed in the beginning I was 
busy marking off the rolling point on all of these uh, by about the third or fourth one I realized I didn't need that by that time but the because uh, you start to get the hang of where how much paper you're going to need then and what you're really doing uh, is you're seeing that the hole in there you're wrapping the paper around the hole stuffing the paper down into the hole so that it creates a, a, a tight space between the ball and the paper and then the powder is going to get poured on the other side of that paper so it, it creates a, a little wedge so when you when you go to take your cartridge tear it open and then go like this the ball doesn't roll out with the powder um, and that and so I'm getting it I finally get what's going on uh, the hard part actually is tying it off and using this choke um, this choke twine is good um, but it took me a while to figure out how to place the choke twine and it's only by the fifth or sixth one that I realized like okay loosely put it around before you put your finger in the end of the paper to hold the ball down in place because that's the other thing it needs to be tight in both directions it needs to be tight against the powder and then tight against the cinch so then you're going to um, you know, loosely wrap it around put your finger in then tie it tighten it down then you got to put this little twine around it and I, I still have I'm hoping I'll figure out how to do that a little better on in the in the future but for now what I'm gonna do is move on to filling these with powder and tying them off like the original cartridge that I made uh, which sort of looks kind of lame um, but that's you know hey that's the way it is um, I'm doing what I'm told um, and we'll go from there Now, I haven't really been commenting on the process of assembling these cartridges because I knew I was going to tell you at each step what I was doing. Um, but you, you can kind of tell. Uh, I'm new to this. I don't know what's going on. I, the, the real challenge for me is trying to find a place to go test these out. So I have enough equipment to make 40 of these, uh, and I need to go shoot them on a shooting range. Um, and that will be that'll be the trick. So actually, as I'm recording this this voiceover, I, I've got plans to go meet at a gun club, and I can talk more about that in the next video because um, I have to go and apply to be a member of the gun club because it's a private shooting range. I want to shoot on an outdoor range. There's a couple of indoor ranges I could go to without being a member, uh, but I really would prefer to shoot this weapon on an outdoor range. Um, and I'll, I'll include video of that in the next video where I talk about actually shooting the musket and talk about you know what it's like to imagine using this as an actual basically household implement it was an important part of your household this is how you got your daily life affairs managed was by having a musket to help you take care of a lot of things so anyway uh you see me now handling all of this uh fun stuff i'm already seeing a couple of places that i need to improve in how i handle it uh, a couple of questions that i might have had before i have actually done this that i'll answer for you Number one is, uh, James, what's black powder like? And, uh, you know, it's kind of just like they describe it or show it in the old Western movies where they pour out powder and light a match and it goes down and blows up the mine or whatever you're trying to blow up in the old movies. Um, no odor to it. Uh, when it burns, I'm sure there will be odor. Um, and the grains are actually pretty regular size. That, that's one of the things about black powder that it's measured differently depending on how fine the grains are. This is FF, uh, double fine grains. There's triple F grains. There's four F grains. The finer the grain, um, the more potential uh, gunpowder you can fit into a particular small space. So. I'm using a measuring, modern measuring instrument, but the old timers would have had um, one made out of, of, of brass or copper, I think, um, that's got little marks on it to tell you where to fill it up. So this is 110 grains of black powder up to this line here. And the 10 grains on the top, give or take, is what you're going to pour in the pan. Uh, if you are going to use a separate powder horn to fill your pan, then you would only fill these with 100 um grains because um a uh, 110 grains would be too much too explosive so um for fun i think i'm going to go out and uh, put a little bit of this out on a piece of paper in my fire pit and light it on fire and see what happens um yeah that's that's the way we're made now if you're if you're on to me at all you're you're probably thinking geez james how come you're not the kind of person who would go make your own black powder i would be if that was doable, I would. And a big part of the success or failure of the Revolutionary War back in the day hinged on whether they could get enough powder. 
Remember, I, I mentioned in videos earlier this year talking about the Revolutionary War um, that there were things called the powder alarms. And these were times when the British marched outside of Boston to some of the towns around in order to seize powder and cannon. It's really about the powder and the cannon. Uh, but the powder is the crucial thing. It was hard to make in the colonies at the time. Most powder had to be imported. Um, and there were, you know, as part of the war effort, um, the War Congress uh, started trying to, you know, pay people to see if they could make black powder here in the colonies because they knew they were dependent on, on imports. Um, but anyway, I, I will research what it takes to make powder and try to figure out. I don't think I will actually make it um, because I'm sure that's probably a violation of something somewhere. Um, but I'm so interested in the fact that uh, having the powder, having the muskets, having the ability to make these cartridges, which, you know, the key to the success was that the people who were now fighting were at home making these. But there were also molds. People had their own molds at home. It was like they had candle molds. They had shot molds. And they would melt down whatever they had, including lead um, dishware and lead utensils in order to make these balls uh, to support the Revolutionary War effort. One of the urban legends during the Revolutionary War circulated by the British, is the British were always, the regulars and their superiors were always trying to argue that they, they were putting down these rebellious colonists who were subhuman and, and um, you know, ungrateful, but also just vicious and mean. Uh, you know, how dare they walk around not uh, behind the trees and the rocks and not in straight formation so that we can fight, that kind of thing. Uh, one of them was that because all of the ball that the British had had been manufactured by contractors in London and in the, in England and then shipped over. They were nice. They were well smoothed. Well, the Americans, the colonists, were making their own and they were doing that um, in these molds that weren't exactly perfect and they were not necessarily filing off the edges where they would separate the mold and take out the ball and so the balls would be jagged or pitted. Now that would be bad for the Americans. There was no reason that the colonists wanted jagged or pitted balls because it could jam the, the weapon, it could scar the weapon on the inside of the, um, of the barrel or the muzzle, and that's all bad. But, um, and, and it messes with your aim because it's not aerodynamic. But if it does leave the muzzle and without damaging the muzzle and it does fly in the direction that you aimed it, um, and it does hit someone, it will tear through them. It'll leave a jagged edge. Like this smooth ball going through, say, someone's side could go straight through like a modern bullet would, and someone could survive that wound much more easily. They wouldn't bleed as much. There wouldn't be as much perforation as it tears through the flesh. The jagged ball tears. Um, and so the British at the time were rumoring that the Americans were deliberately, the colonists, were deliberately making ragged balls so that it would tear and inflict the maximum suffering and damage on someone not only to ensure that they died but to ensure that it was very very painful as they died this is an example of the way wars are fought where people are rumoring on all sides we see that today with the uh, conflict happening in the ukraine so um i will do more of this and i will get my i'm gonna try to have 20 of these ready to go so for my first test fire which hopefully will happen next week and then um, I will hopefully be taking you out hunting with me later on. The primitive weapons deer hunt season in Massachusetts runs from December 12, I think, to December 31st, which means I can take my musket out hunting and for the first time in my life aim at and maybe fire at a deer. As I've told you from the very beginning, I'm not a gun guy and I'm not a hunter. Um, but I'm trying to understand the life of these people who lived by these weapons and for whom the right to bear arms was as much a responsibility to bear arms. And um, so I'm trying to understand what their experience was like. Thanks for joining me.